Are you just a normal person who's trying to pay rent, get groceries, go home, maybe check out the new Katsis and play games with the boys? Boys. Well, this video really doesn't have anything about it, but we are calling out game journalists for access journalism or game access journalism. We're calling out corporations for a lack of accountability and ownership. And really, this is just me putting on my farmer hat because I'm farming content by reacting to ads and then reacting to another video of a gentleman who is just honestly super based he, he was one of the devs who created fallout if you guys know the fallout series uber popular wasn't my kind of game but he just has a really base take of what's going on in the gaming you know studio scene but I, as you guys will tell later on in the video i think it stems to a much larger area where it literally is just corporate america at this point by the way it's not just publishers and developers that i see all this caution with i've seen a huge rise in caution in game journalism Ooh. it's become the Ooh. here we go uh oh uh oh bingo the norm that Say no it. one want, no journalist wants to risk getting into an embargo situation where they're not given a an early access code so they can't write their review access journalism isn't that cute don't we all love access journalism isn't that just so good for us the consumer earlier than other people the short answer is no they're worried about not being invited to no it is not press events let me contextualize that just a little bit for people that might not understand what's going on so Thank what happens is like how many of us. you guys feel like a lot of games get unfair ratings like they get a really high rating whenever they don't deserve it like concord game journalists gave it like an 8.6 out of 10 they were like it's fantastic it's the new wave man it's a fresh take on the first person shooter space Yes, yeah, suck my whole ass. Why does that happen? And often a lot of times these really high ratings come from journalists in these big places that are giving them to games that are from large studios, okay? So why does this happen? It's because the journalists that give positive reviews are going to be given preference potentially on getting Not access to future Definitely. reviews. And because reviews on early access games and being able to get that information out as quickly as possible is massively profitable and influential in their career, they are more willing to not provide a more critical evaluation of a game because they don't want to lose future access to not only games, but then also like intangible things like going to events where you can, uh, you know, network with people yeah. that are in the industry and things like that. Because if you're constantly saying that the games are bad, maybe you don't get invited to that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it, the the company, the publisher, the dev is going to look at you, and if you're not saying nice things about their baby, you're not coming over to the, the, the family cookout. And what it does is it creates a massive chilling effect in the entire gaming industry for, like, giving any sort of feedback that's authentic. And I do think that this is primarily an issue with written journalism, and there are a number of YouTube content creators that do provide extremely fair and good reviews. Uh, Mortismal Gaming, Skill Up, Force Gaming, I think all provide incredibly great reviews, and I watch all. I found Force Gaming through Asmin, and now I watch Force Gaming for the same thing of somebody who, like, I have a similar take on games, and he lays out just really good points, and sometimes he lays something out, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about that. I didn't stuff. even know to look at that. So I'm not saying that they're bad. or I don't really watch all of it, but if it's a game I like watching, I'll probably look at what they have to say. Like Skill Up, for example, like a really great example, Skill Up shit on Final Fantasy 16. But what about that review was really wrong, you know? And people got really mad at him. And, uh, like, that's the thing. And I, th I do think, like, YouTube reviewers are less uh, affected by this. Because they have more different, they're self-employed, and too, they have more to ways YouTube to make money videos than, than like a, an individual like journalist that just does reviews written. Because you just can't make money on written media in the same way that you can with like a video. So that's like totally. another problem is that like the journalists that have to do like the written reviews that you see all the time on like Google and like. Is it like a Paul Tassi who works for like uh, somebody? Like Kotaku, IGN, etc. They're the ones who are most beholden to industry norms. You see you what I'm could, saying? You can also see it in their videos too because they're the ones who or, sound the most reserved you know, on all of their So that's what happens. Fraud. 
all their so opinions a lot are of them reserved. Are going a lot more tamed. cautious in what they say. Not I like really maybe miss like a, the like a, a phase Ronaldo stream. I'll name a couple like Scorpia in the '80s and '90s and Deslock in the '90s and early 2000s. No, because I'm not reading one of them. Yeah, it's those too old two for me. people, those two reviewers said what they thought. If you put out a game, they skewer you for all the things that were wrong with it, but then they praise you for everything that's right with it. I think that's also a problem with, um, like, with with gaming content creators in general. Like, for example, whenever I was talking about Lies of P, IGN gave Starfield a 7 out of 10. I think for a Bethesda enjoyer, Starfield probably is a 7 out of 10. I do. Like, I, I think it's probably a 7 out of 10, sure. Like, I said it's a 5 or a 6, probably a 6 for me, and I'm not a fan of those kinds of games. So I think that if it's somebody who does like them, then yeah, I think a 7 would be fine. I you know, and I think this honest to God, I think I just, it kind of clicked in my brain. I think the reason why creators like Asmongold, like Charlie, even creators like Sneeko or Destiny, they don't have this issue that I think leadership and corporates have at this moment, and that is accountability and ownership. I genuinely feel, and this is brought up even earlier in this video, uh, and I'll link the video down in the comments. But people are not, or people are afraid to take ownership and accountability in, in apparently in their own lives and in their own professional careers. And when you're afraid to take that ownership, when you're afraid to take accountability with your own thoughts and who you are and and, and what you believe as a person, we get this kind of intangible mushy thing that has real no substance and, and you don't want to be that i don't think that's off of the uh you know that's unfair or anything like that ign gives everything a seven maybe but like the point is that that is true ign does uh, give everything a seven actually I what was the fucking point right um the point is that Same. like whenever I, I you're providing a review well. to an audience a lot of times people don't want to hear bad What's things up, about a good game and people don't want to hear good things about a bad game like, for example, whenever I talk about the good things that Diablo 4 has, people don't want to hear about it. Because and whenever I talk about Diablo the bad 4. things, something like Lies of P, like earlier, uh, there were a lot of people that were, like, trying to counter me and, like, say that I was wrong about these things. And I think this is a very common trait that people have, is that people want to defend Bye, what they enjoy, and they want to attack what they don't enjoy. And that's the main focus that they have. It's not about pursuing... An objective truth it's not about understanding the game it's about having their existing opinion be reinforced they want to be told that the thing that they think you're right no one wants to hear good things about new world that's right and no one wants to hear bad things about classic wow actually maybe no one wants to hear really good things about concord i'm sure there's a small few who are like oh my god please but no one wants to hear say anyone no one is is going to accept the rhetoric that Concord was a good game. That one isn't as true. I just hate Concord. I don't know. But if you definitely guys can tell. the New World example. No journalistic integrity. I think a lot of people just don't want to swim against the uh, against the current, right? They don't want to go against the grain and yeah, cause themselves a bunch of unnecessary be, stress. They're afraid now, to be unique. It's sort of like, about PoE. Well, yeah, exactly. we really like this, but they don't want to like really double down on it because it may be that something people don't like. Better, so, like, let's say a journalist loves the diversity in a game, he may go, "Well, I'm not going to say that that much because I don't want to, yeah, come across as being pandering." And also, some people yell when you talk about that. So I just no, it's true, right? Because like different people have different values. Like, if somebody cares about diversity or representation or whatever, then they should be able to say it. But the problem is that there's a lot of people out there who don't like it, yeah. and so then they're going to attack them. And but this is once more where I feel like you doing – if you're this person, you're this journalist who is doing this, and like you like the diversity in a game and you're afraid to say, man, I feel like this is a really healthy, diverse game and, and implemented in a good way, people are going to attack you for it. But I feel like you just got to own up to that idea and just understand that. No matter what, you take a hundred people in a room, ten percent of them aren't gonna like anything you say just because they woke up on the wrong side of the bed that morning, and, and they may like change their mind tomorrow. Has, like, I'm not saying that anybody is in the wrong for their opinion about a video game. I think that you should be, be able opinion, to though. look at objective things, and you have that, to objective have things that are that wrong game. or right with a game, like for example, hitboxes. I think hitboxes are a problem that certain games have, and it is, like, objectively garbage in certain games, and there is no denying it. 
like, and then there's X other Defiance games like code. Remnant that have the best hitboxes in any game I've ever played. Mm. So it, it just really depends. I think there are objective things, but many things in reviews are subjective. For me, I get that for Destiny. I think that's a lot of the, one passion of the best gunplay game out I've ever of game played. journalism. And they're really just trying to go for how, what can what kind of review can I write that generates the most clicks? Exactly. And I guess this worries me because if I see this everywhere, if I see this in publishers and developers, and now it's soulless new people entering the industry, they, yeah, they don't original. have this passion anymore. So, well, another reason why they don't have the passion is because they have to make seven reviews a week. And they have to play a video game as much as they can in order to like think about it, right? You've got. I, I like. I also worked at like a, a media company for a little bit, and I could tell you from somebody who at least likes to think of themselves as a creative person, working at like a media company, like especially like a, a, a television company, they will flush the creativity right out of you because the creativity is not most often times for some odd reason, quote unquote, not ad friendly or maybe pushing the grain a little too much and, and it makes them uncomfortable. And if it makes them uncomfortable, then in their position of power, they say, nope, it's gonna make everybody else uncomfortable. You gotta do seven, like let's say you've gotta do three reviews in a week, right? So you're gonna work 40 hours in the week. Can you play three games to completion or to enough Hell competency no. to provide a thorough review that is authentic to a viewer within 40 hours and the answer is it depends on the game with a game like blasphemous i think yes you can probably hit that game for like 15 hours and you can get what you need to get out of it if you're proficient with metroidvania games but with something like starfield absolutely not something with elden ring absolutely not and what the issue is, is if you take one person and they're supposed to review elden ring and starfield and this blasphemy game well, those are three very, very different games that require different kind of coordination, whether it be with your hands and eyes and understanding the controller and the mechanics of the game, that maybe putting 40 hours in one week in that game before you make a, a review, and you just don't have enough time. Like, th And also, not to be rude, these game journalists aren't good enough gamers. They're not, they're not form uh, formal. They're not Shotzi. They didn't win a world championship in two different titles. To, to be able to bridge the gap of really being able to pl like play a game at a high level or a competent enough level. It's crazy to me. And also, again, it's not just making the game. It's then also um, writing the article, getting the article approved, editing the article. And so you have all the extra work that goes on top of it. And again, a lot of these reviewers aren't making the same kind of money that YouTube people are making. And I think this is actually like a huge problem. And I understand that like... Truthfully, written I, media. I have a, is, a unique take like, on this. Like a lot of YouTube not unique, essays a, a, are written a media take in spoken what form. To say, that's what I'm saying. Unique. Really, but my brain is going is down a completely different hole. I think it's a problem this. that. I agree with him though. When was the last? Here's a good question. When was the last piece of written media that was transformative and meaningful for the gaming community? Like what? Gamergate? Something like that? For like 2014? So I think that maybe the last time something for me might have been like one of those fucking completionist guides for like uh, Pokemon games. Like, you know, when you, like I know you guys have to remember this of like when you go to Walmart and Walmart still had the, the controller and you could look up on the screen to play. It would have guides to different games that you were playing, whether it be for Metroid or for Zelda, for me, Pokemon. Like, you know, that might have been the last transformative piece of actual written media for me. This is a huge problem. It's a massive issue. And the reason why is because written media, I think, is very important because written media is the purest form of a transmission of an idea. It takes away the uh, like, obviously, there is a certain personality with writing that you have or at least that you should have. Like, for example, if you read something that XQC writes on uh, on Twitter, you know, it's from XQC. Right. And uh, a few other people, it's the same That's thing. Fair. Like That's Dante's fair. on Twitter as well. Uh, I can think of many other ones. And I think this is an incredibly, by the way, this is an incredibly good thing. Uh, having a voice in writing is incredibly important. Uh, but the truth is that a lot of people don't have that. And a lot of people, I'll just say it, a lot of people can't fucking read. Like they can look at the words, 
They but they can't really uh, digest the words for what they really mean. Understand what the words mean, but they can't really fucking read. And it's a massive problem. Yeah. Because people are not communicating through ideas. I mean, that's what ideas. I've been saying. My they're idea of making America feelings, great they're communicating again is through vibes, the, the they're communicating through IQ implications, all Americans. and not really and raw ideas. I don't think ideas. that's a bad thing. You know, what's the moral of all this? I've got, I, I want to tell people, just go and make it. Make what you want. You don't need a committee to sign yeah. off on it. You know what I was just thinking before we go further on in this video? Is that it sh shocks me that some of these companies like IGN or any of these game review companies aren't going to these LAN events and trying to recruit gamers who are articulate, charismatic enough because they're gonna, they, they, it might not be the competitors, but the, the spectators, the actual fans, the consumers of it may have uh, see the opportunity to be able to work in a gaming industry. And now you've recruited a passionate individual who you deemed as charismatic and articulate enough. And maybe you can, you could test them. Maybe you say, hey, here's my email. Send me something. Give me like a review of, of this event. Right. And that could be like a, a mock interview. I'm, I'm surprised that that doesn't happen for these companies to, to, to generate new leads and new gaming talent or journalistic talent. You can always go back because and going change through college, it. Well, you're again, not going like, to get gamers. I understand why reviewers are gun shy. Again, look at Skill Up's review of Final Fantasy 16. Nothing he said in that review, I think is fundamentally wrong. Personally, I don't value the things that he values as much. However, did I say 14? I meant 16. But, um, Again, his review is absolutely true. And also another great example, somebody's got it in chat. True, Actman's review of Diablo 4. People said Actman uh Actman doesn't know what he's talking about because he didn't do World Tier 4. Why would somebody do World Tier 4 if they've dropped 30 or 40 hours onto the game and they're still not having fun? That's like This is also the beautiful thing about like everyone having their own opinion. And it may not be the same as yours, but it doesn't make it any less valid than yours. And I think that statement makes people's brain just kind of fuse out with search circuit because guess what? Not everyone's going to agree with you. Not everyone's going to uh, think the same way that you and I do. It's like saying, why didn't you finish your plate of dog shit? How can you say that it's all dog shit if you didn't eat the entire plate of dog shit? When the truth is that anybody who actually played the game would know that it got even worse at that point. You see what I'm saying? But he got shit on so much, he made a follow-up video out of it. I defended him. And I even thought that some of the things, I disagreed with some of the things he said about the uh, the Diablo 4 video. But there it is. The sunken cost fallacy binds players into getting their money's worth. It's more than that, but I think that's part of it. Make something and it turns out not to be good at all. So it's like, that's why people are gun shy about providing reviews that go against the grain. On oh, unsalvageable, throw it away. But that, that rapid, iteration to get to some really good ideas a lot better than just being so cautious that you basically creep up to a very mundane game there's a, a term for this uh paralysis by analysis that doesn't show any kind of passion in its development people can tell people can tell yeah so Soul i started with Soul stories let me end out. with those three stories and how they kind of got resolved Ooh. So, Ooh. What the I didn't even try to do the whiteboard solution when I made. And uh, how did that affect the bugs in the game? So, if, for a little context, because we started this probably halfway through this actual video, the the whiteboard uh, that is being brought up is there was two whiteboards in his original gaming studio that he worked at. One with the the one board had bugs, and the 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 dev assigned to fixing that bug when he started taking the lead at another studio he was going to implement that same thing because it just seemed very efficient no one really complained and he said the team took pride in getting things done off of that whiteboard going to this new team they said we're absolutely not going to do that whiteboard and if you try to implement the whiteboard we're quitting and as it says huh i wonder how many bugs got resolved in that second game World. And I wonder. What I did is I made my own confluence page called, like, I was Tim Kane's top 10 or something. It was in my confluence space, and I wrote, here are the 10 biggest things I want looked at this week.
And there were a few producers who would look at that page all the time. What was great about this solution? Nobody could come and complain to me about it because it was in my confluence space. My own personal, but public, confluence space. Also, I'd like to point out that anybody could go to so Jira. So you remove the accountability from it? At any time. It's not even and the accountability. It's probably like a, an email thing. So it's literally not a physical whiteboard that people have to look at. And that physical whiteboard with a, a bug and their name attached to it just gives them too much anxiety. Say, what are the 10 most high prior, highly prioritized bugs and who are they assigned to? So we already had that whiteboard virtually, but somehow it was okay that it wasn't called attention to. For the combat... Accountability. Yep. This is what that I was saying earlier. Code, Accountability I think I said over two weeks, and I think it got done biggest problem right now in, in Great. Like I got it. leadership positions yeah. and corporate America. I don't think America. I asked for anything after that. I didn't go and specifically ask for anything because I realized that I was being viewed as some sort of ogre <laughs> when I knew something could be done faster. All right, Shrek. And there was no solution to it, which is why... I know what the solution to it is. Fire the people that are complaining and get people that know how to work. Yeah. That's the fucking solution. And I once more, I'm surprised. Like, these people who are fans of gaming, who are devs, they, like, go to these indie gaming areas. Go Or look at the top indie games. See who's popping off. See who's developing them. Interview them. Like, I don't understand why it's so hard. Why are we looking at Indeed for gaming developers when they're putting their work out there why not hire from the best and then also also if we can be real with these large corporations why are we doing these weird temporary contracts why are we not actually hiring out these devs creating actual wings in the studio and allowing them to stay in the company for multiple years at a time and allowing the same group of people to work and and actually start and finish a game and actually see it through instead of a team starting it, another team kind of halfway getting at it and passing it like it's a baton. And if we, we continue to do that, we're going to see that these games just feel like they don't have a soul. That they feel like they're patched work together. People like that are absolute fucking cancer. And the moment that they're there, everything that they touch and interact with is going to be worse. Actually true. That's it. Yeah, Years ago, I started thinking, ooh, this is becoming a problem. I wonder, we're looking back. Same thing with like, Leonard and I not yelling at each other. Like, Man, was that we just kept doing it. We're like, it's our <laughs> office. We are shut the door. We're not mad at each other. But this is the way we get things done. Mm -hmm. Note, noted that people don't, some people don't like it. We won't get things done like that with you. And let me tell you, I think there were people who felt like they missed out on not being parts of those conversations. Some yeah, people sure. would come over. Uh, Charlie... Um, had his office right next door and he would the lead designer on on outer worlds and he would come in sometimes and join in great other people didn't do that you missed out and i think you missed out on some really fun active engaging conversations about game development but that's the way things are going so i'm not sure i have a great solution other than telling people reminding people to be passionate but I just kind of want to talk about this because it kind of ties into bigger teams and longer development time and big bigger teams, more displacement of accountability, longer development time, less, uh, you know, ownership. importance of working. Less ownership in their, in their work and what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, less yeah, pride in what they're doing. Tasks. Yep your budgets just twitter. this whole game development oh i think twitter is a great example elon fired like 80 percent of the people at twitter it works still works fucking fine yep uh -huh. yeah I, I don't think they needed that many people no i i've said this about so many of these game Caution. studios that have like 1500 employees cut that cut that literally by a third reduce that budget and put it into games hire the best people let them start middle finish and see that game through instead of hiring six going through six different contracting phases through devs like come on and that's rising up in the industry so there whew, got that off my chest feel good buddy what an incredible video i'm actually I, I, true. i'm so glad i watched this this guy 
I, I'm I'm so glad to see this. Based as fuck. Timothy Kane. What 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 great insight? Uh, I'll link it to you guys. Yeah, there you go. There's the video. That is so fucking good. I think that honestly, I I don't think it's caution. I think it's just people that are trying. I think he was being politically correct when he was saying caution. It's just people trying. Uh, this is what as is gonna say. People being lazy, trying to pad a stat, saying hey. This realistically will take me only two days to do, but I'm going to tell my boss it's going to take me two weeks to do. Sorry, this you want it done? It's going to take two weeks, and realistically, it can take two days. And we've already seen. There, I, I don't know what like um, study this is, but there's a study out there where if you give people a certain amount of time or a certain amount of budget to fix a problem, they're going to use 100% of the time or 100% of that budget. So if you give someone a long time or a long budget, they're just going to burn so much wasted time and wasted budget instead of forcing them to be resourceful and be creative and be um you know like learn how to stretch their time and their dollar longer to skirt accountability and people don't want to be tied down to being at fault for anything going wrong that happens to investors has only invested the game deploys within two years and they need the investment i don't know like i mean uh, like that how could i possibly know that if like that example you're giving me is like one like one point in like a 100 point variable situation how could i possibly make that decision they disguise it as it's my anxiety as if it's the employer's responsibility to deal with that i think that there's always going to be a give and take with true. that kind of stuff but at a point where there is time dilation that takes a two or four hour task into a four week task I don't think that's acceptable. Skirting accountability is one thing, but they nitpick others into paralysis by being cautious to not offend the snowflakes. I don't know. I think that's kind of like that. That, that sounds like a personal agenda to me, man. Uh, it sounds like uh -huh. the same as discussion a few days ago about being outsourced to India and whose fault it is. Yeah, definitely. On the other side of this happening, a psychopath businessman will make other people the fall guys and then make them avoid responsibility. It's a cycle. Yeah, but like we talk about how those are bad too, right? I mean, like I think everybody knows that's bad. But all I'm saying is that, like, we don't really hear a lot about, like, it's it's good to have somebody from the industry who actually has worked in game development, has had multiple successes in game development, say the thing that, like, I don't know, like, whenever I see a bug in a game and it takes, like, s six weeks to fix or, like, three months to fix, like, I, I think that's bullshit, man. I do. I think it's fucking bullshit. And I don't think it should take that long. I think they're lying. I think they're fucking lazy. And I don't think there's any excuse. Straight up. Is this uh, driving an office culture uh, with one toxic time leadership with in general? Well, I think that's not only like asking somebody to perform a task in a, in, a, in a fast way. That's not toxic leadership. That's accountability. Like, uh, I, yeah, I, th there, there has to be a point where there is accountabil accountability, especially like, I don't know, me, me being like a, a prior athlete, I tend to look at everything as sports. And if you have a, a guy whose position it is to get to point A to B as quickly as possible, and he's really fast, and like let's say he's running like a four flat, but he's consistently running at like a four four, maybe a four three, and you're like, yo, I need you to run at like a four two minimum. We know you're capable of more. Holding them to that four two is, is, is a, that's that's a true accountability. And then if anything, pushing them to hold that four. And if anything, try to beat that four, even though now that's like beating a four forty. We're getting into the nuance of things. I got lost in the sauce. I think that sometimes people always people. This is what happens, right? Is that people take any time that they're held accountable for their bad behavior or bad actions personal. as just toxic behavior. Yeah, no, way too sometimes whenever other people are hostile to you, it's because you deserve it. It's because you did the thing wrong and now other people are suffering because of you. Yeah, do your job is toxic. Get the fuck out of here. Rax today talked about implementing a small change in a Blizzard game. It takes weeks due to multi-platform approval, even if the development itself might only take a day. Really? Okay, that's not true because look at World of Warcraft. It's only on PC and they take weeks and probably years to fix problems. How many years? The hell? was razor Gore the untamed spawning extra ads after he died five years Get the fuck out of here no it had nothing to do with multi-platform it's again blizzard it's again it's what i it's just like this example 
always obfuscating. Yeah, always, gaming, oh, well, that's not really what the problem is. Uh -huh. No, Desmond no, is. no. There's always a fucking he is excuse. A gym. He's an internet Seems gym. pretty clear you haven't worked in a large corporation in a while. So, what's your argument? If you worked in a large corporation where there was a lot of bloat and people being hired to do no no work, then you would understand that bloat and people being hired to do no work is acceptable. I'm not I don't need to be in a corporation. I'm the fucking customer. I don't need to be a fucking expert in making software to to see that having to wait 3 months for a simple bug fix is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I could I could I, I could 1 million percent say I work at, in a mainstream broadcasting network station, and that we did advertisements, we did creative leads and things. I, I can assure you, something that should take that start and finish one day would take a month to do, right? And there was language barriers, there was creative barriers, there's leadership barriers, and it's just bloat, man. It, and there's just so many la unnecessary layers and chain of command in these companies that what Elon did with Twitter, I swear, there's going to be so many CEOs who are looking at this now who are like, okay, how can we take the PR hit of laying off a third of our company because it's going to run exactly the same? And if anything, in the long run, once it kind of like irons out the kinks in the armor, it may run better than what it did before. Enterprise developer, pull me up. Give me a second. Let me look at what you've got to say. And I'll speak to a larger issue with Americans when it comes to this issue is that we're so impatient because we look at this like from my background with personal training. If somebody came in and they spent 20 years of destroying their body, getting unhealthy, becoming fat, they get frustrated when they can't turn it around in six weeks. The same thing with these companies when it takes giant changes like when Elon came and X'd out a lot of uh, Twitter – it's still in that phase of ironing out the kinks. Twitter was around so much longer than the time that that has happened. So now we have to allow the same amount of time to see, okay, where was this actually a good idea? And, yes, we could use projections and see, uh, you know, like charts to kind of gauge the waters ahead of us. But still, those aren't always 100%, and they're just predictions. At the end of the day, until the shit hits the fan, until the rubber hits the pavement, you – don't know and it's gonna take you have to commit to the time god damn that's the most important one what do you what do you want committing to the time what do you want you've been following through. for three years come on let's go pretty obvious i haven't worked in a big corporation before no i haven't i worked in the government and you know what there were a lot of things in the government that could have been done faster and do you know why they were The government is just a large corporation. Let's keep it a stack of fucking pancakes. Weren't done? It's because people weren't working. They went to work, and they weren't working. It's just corporate development. You have 10 engineers and 20. Yeah, they have two monitors, and one of them has a Twitch stream pulled up like I did and had TP up, and I would just watch TP. And then around 1 o'clock when a Joe Rogan podcast would turn on, I'd turn on Joe Rogan and watch for the rest of the day. My job was just useless bullshit charts. 20 managers? What's the point? The flip side is project managers who serve no purpose other than constantly asking, is it done yet? And not understanding what it actually takes to get something simple done. And do you remember what I said about um, why I would never make a game? And a lot of the frustrations from the people who are saying, like this person who's like, hey, we're constantly asking you like, to get it done. It's because I had pressure from my bosses of, hey, why aren't these people getting it done? And then I didn't have the, really, the qualifications to articulate and have a good conversation, a creative conversation on why, and a good enough answer to my bosses on why it's taking so long. Instead, it needs to just to be a yes sir, no sir, or, or yes ma'am, no ma'am kind of situation at these places. And they it's, don't accept nuance. It's because I don't know how to code a game. And I don't think that I could accurately tell people what to do and be in a leadership role without having any understanding of what I'm doing. Two managers for every engineer. So it happens regulator, uh, regularly. Uh, so the project's a mess. You report an error or an issue with the game. You have to wait for three layers of approval. See, that's an issue. Is that not a bad thing? I don't think anybody's debating that. That's a bad thing. That's the I issue. think that's actually the point that I'm making. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, that's the entire point that I make. You're right. That's the thing. Yes, you're totally right. He's just saying why it takes so long. 
Yeah, well, for no sure. shit. I don't think that's the only reason. I think some of them are fucking lazy too. Yeah, but this is in every industry. This may be just for the gaming or this development industry, but like in government and and media and and medical and like in all industries, this is a major problem right now. Like, I'm not going to accept that all of them are actually super fucking motivated and they show up to work on time and they want to do their job and like it's all the upper management's fault. I don't think it's all that. That sounds like bullshit to me. But I understand that it's a group effort to fail. Is that approval and the engineer didn't want to work? Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is management sucks most of the time. Uh, I can fix it in 10 minutes by stuff away from manager's manager to approve something and to be at the same point. Yeah. You're right. And this is what I said before about being uh, like AAA games being too big to succeed. It's because like AAA games take so long to turn the ship and to be able to move around and actually like, screw up. Uh, at least to start the fucking task, working in the car industry. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I understand for sure. Chad is right. No, he is right. He's definitely right. Yeah, the guy's not wrong, but the, the issue is... And Absolutely. This feels like a, we go back to like school, and you're doing a math problem, and it's like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? And the teacher's like, okay, show your work. And then you show the work, and it's like, hey, that's not the way that I taught you how to do this. Uh, so even though there's multiple ways to skin a cat, and there's multiple ways to get the answer 4 out of it, or like, you know, whatever... It's not the way that they taught you. It's not the way that they want the answer to be done. So until you fix the problem the way that they want it to be fixed, so it doesn't matter if it gets fixed because if you fix it in an expedited way that you know how to, but it's not fixed how they want it to be fixed, well, guess what? You got to undo what you did. You got to fix it the way that they want it to be fixed, which just doubles the time. Absolutely. It's also bad coding, which makes fixing stuff a hassle, and it takes one week instead of 15 minutes. On a PO or a Scrum Master, you don't know how agile development works, as one. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, um, I, I think every job, every single thing that I've ever been involved in has incompetent people at every level. Yeah, it's and not just I think to assume game development. that there are, there are no incompetent people at the implementation level is delusional. Yeah, no, there's it doesn't matter if it's in Twitch. It doesn't matter if it's in World of Warcraft. It doesn't matter if it's a group of friends. It doesn't matter anything. There yeah. are always going that's to be people that aren't pulling their weight, that aren't doing what they need to do, and that's just how it is. It's that it's that way with the government. Like there were people there that would be on the phone with their family the whole time, not working. I remember this, and this is this was such a massive fucking like reality check for me is that we had this part of the our, our job right yeah. it actually was not our job but we did this at the end of the day because okay. it's like what the fuck else are you gonna do sure and so time, uh, I get it. We, we would go through Can't the garbage before five. literally we would go through the garbage to make sure that nobody threw away extra tax documents that simple and there was a person who was working there Yo. who literally had down syndrome like, it's not like they were, like, stupid or something like that. They actually had Down syndrome. And the first thing that I thought is, why the fuck is somebody that actually has Down syndrome working on our tax documents? This is very unsettling. <laughs> and then I watched them work. And while everybody else was talking to each other on their phone. He was doing the and test. And laughing. Or they were doing the Distracted. Test. The person with Down syndrome was looking at the paper making sure that there were no tax documents thrown away. So yes, there are people that are incompetent at every level. So yes, uh, I learned it. You know, it's not a code uh, to work and making a game, a bunch of crucial roles that need zero understanding on code. Oh, I, I understand husband. what you're saying, but I don't agree with it. I think that in order for you, I, I've never found a situation that not understanding, like it's actually like, it, it's, it's literally me being the like, remember what I said the other day about how it's never a good thing that an artist doesn't understand the game that they're making art for? Like, it, it's never a good thing, and it's probably neutral at worst and bad realistically. And I think it's even more the case for, like, other types of engineers, etc. I practice what I preach. I think it's bad even then. Because, like, the way I look at it is that... Um, so like this goes back right so like in I, I went to business school and um i was getting a degree in computer information systems which is primarily like process analysis and process management and so like in doing that you go through a lot of flow charts and creating like uh like workflow type stuff cool. and so 
like the way that I visualize things, especially with like making like I even did this with like making farming guides and stuff like that. CIS, yeah, um, it, it is like I see how the different dots fit together, and I know that yes, obviously you're not connect, you're not directly connected to that other dot, but down the line, you, you know, five different levels or pages below, these two things need to be on the same page, and if they're not. Then it's a problem. I should creation of Stephen Sharif as creative director. You can do something like that. I'm sure Stephen Sharif has extensive knowledge in programming after doing it and working with them for five years. I think that if you if you showed Stephen Sharif the coding for the game, he might not understand every letter and every bracket, but he would understand. He would have a gist of what he's looking at. If you made it to this point in the video, you basically watched the entirety of it. Genuinely, thank you for taking the time out of your day and just listen to me blabber or listen to me react to Asmin. And I have to, I kind of agree, not to kind of, I totally agree with Asmin. And I definitely think these corporations, Bungie, Sony's, the Activision of the world that have thousands of employees or more than a thousand employees, they're looking at Elon and Twitter and seeing, hey, he got 75% of his staff and it's running fine. Right? How could we do the same thing? And in the long run, or in the short run, you might have like a little hiccup with PR and you know laying off so many people. And I think we're starting to see waves of that now with Activision, with Microsoft, or yeah, with Microsoft, with Sony, and Bungie recently having these layoffs. But I think it's strategic in the sense that these companies are taking small PR hits at a time to take out the bloat of the company. And hopefully in the next, I don't know, two to three years, these companies are going to be running much more efficiently. But right now, this is kind of that hiccup period but let me know what you guys think down below keep it respectful keep it plp peace love positivity and with that said i'll see you guys tomorrow for the next one peace